Either you're going to know everything or adhere to the God who does know all things. First, first of all, what's wrong with appealing to absurdity? It is good to be back with you again in this lovely warm city. <laughs> because I come from a cold region, or what I consider cold. You go higher north and it gets even colder. So I, I'm glad to be in the state of Florida. So we're going to be in Isaiah 55. We're going to work through verses 1 through, what did I say, 12? So yeah, well, we'll just take the whole chapter. My goodness, it's just one verse left in the chapter. So if, if I could be with you for a bit here today and you've allowed me to be here to share God's Word, I would want to do something with you today. I want you to take with me, take with me your mind that God has given you. And I want to transport you back to a time when this book was written. So you have to become a Jew for a little bit, okay? This is the way you're going to understand this text better and have a deeper love, a deeper hunger for what's here. So you're, you're a Jew for an for, for hour or so here, or three hours, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So this book was written uh, somewhere between 700 and 740 <coughs> B.C. Isaiah was, was a prophet to the nation of Israel. The Assyrian army was hovering over them. The shadow of, of a country that was coming to defeat Israel was, was imminent. It was coming in around them. And every time Israel got to a position where they were in sin, God would send punishment. And then he would gently restore them. But we have here in, in this chapter and in the several verses in the book of Isaiah, this glimpse, if you will, this, this aroma of something that's coming that has not yet showed up, but is going to get there. It's going to arrive. And I want you to ask yourself that question. What is it that's coming? What is it that's going to show up in the future that is going to bring this eternal fruit? Okay? So if we break the section of Scripture down into chewable pieces, it will be verses 1 and 2. I would consider, come and listen to this giving God. Okay, that's verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 and 5, if you're taking notes, would be another section, would be come to this covenant-keeping God. Verses 6 through the remaining other verses would be come near to this complex God. So what I'm going to do now is simply read the Word of the Lord, and then we will simply go down through the text. Come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, or your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion to him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, 
so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord. An everlasting sign that will not be cut off. So remember I told you about the, the glimpse, the verses that kept showing up in this book leading up to 55. Showing about this off distant king that was coming to make peace that people were going to be able to seek. We see it begin in chapter 1 verse 18 where the Lord says, come let me reason with you, though your sins be as red as crimson, I will make them white as snow. We see it again in chapter 9, verse 6, where this child, the government, government was going to be upon his shoulders. He was going to bring this peace. And then we see it in the, the neighboring chapter in Isaiah 53, where the chastisement that was upon him, the punishment that was upon him, what is going to bring peace. So now we're here in chapter 55, and what is going on here <coughs> is how he was going to do it. And things that we need to remember in this chapter is this God has an everlasting covenant with, like we'll see. And this God is faithful to his word. And his word is the very thing that produces fruit. And tipping my hand of, of this coming one because we're Jews, remember? Jesus is the Word. And Jesus was the one who was going to come and give peace by sacrifice on that cross. But not too much there already. So if you're a Bible student and you, you read the Bible, I, as I said in, in the Sunday school class this morning, always circle or underline repeated words. Now we have in the first verse here, we have in the first verse here, him using the word C-O-M-E four times. So whenever you see that, you should pick up on, all right, something's going on. I got to pay attention to what's going on here. The author, Isaiah, is saying here, come, everyone who's thirsty, come to the waters. He who has the money, come, buy and eat, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. So what is he trying to say here? He's saying, come. The gift that I'm going to give you isn't going to cost anything. He's saying, come to Christ. He's reminding these Israelites, you Jewish people, that there's going to come one that you're not going to have to work anymore. You're not going to have to do traditions anymore. You're not going to have to work for your right relationship with God. And he's reminding them that here. What do we see in John 17? I mean, John 7, 38. Jesus is the living water. That's one of the nourishments for your body. You need water to live, right? Jesus said he's the living water. What does he say in John chapter 6, verse 35? He says he's the bread of life. Those are the two things that every, every human body needs to live. You need water and you need bread. And the author here, the prophet, is reminding them of that. That he's going to come and he's going to give you nourishment for your soul. He's going to set you free spiritually. He's going to be, allow you to be at peace with him. And then he reminds them here in verse 2. Why do you spend money on that which is not bread? Or why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? And that's what Israel was doing. They were running, they were running after things that did not truly satisfy them. They were running after idols. They were running after other gods. They were running after kings and countries and this and that. But yet, it did not satisfy them. And he's saying, come to me. This one who was coming, the coming king was the one who was going to truly satisfy them. And then we have to ask direct application to our life. Where in our life 
Are we running after things that don't truly satisfy? Where in our life are we putting things in the place of God that God should be in? And notice what he does in verse 2. He says, listen. Just like when we were talking in Sunday school class. And not just give it a passing hearing like a truck going by down the road. You go, oh, what was that? No. You want to listen diligently. You want to be a student of this word. You want to be a student of God's word. You want to sit under the preaching of the word. You want to sit under good teachers. You want to ask good questions. You want to be diligent when it comes to the word of God. When it comes to applying the word of God to your life. And look in verse 3. We're moving on to our second section. Come to this covenant keeping God. He tells them again in the very beginning of this verse, incline your ear. Listen to what's being said. Because if you're not listening, if you're not paying attention, then you're not hearing what the prophet is trying to say to you, Jews. That there's coming one. That is going to satisfy you in a deep way. That's going to satisfy you in such a way that you have never known. Can you imagine sacrificing animals for your sins again and again? Trying to follow 600 plus laws? Can you imagine that? 600 plus laws? Second section of verse 3, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Now let me read to you where that came from because he made a covenant with David. I'm not driving by him here. I'm watching the screen. You have to bear with me now. So it says, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 7, 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established Forever. And that's referring to King David. So King David was going to have this everlasting covenant. And the prophet is reminding these Jews there is going to come a covenant that's going to do away with this old covenant. There's going to come an everlasting covenant through the house of David. David was from the tribe of Judah. From the tribe of Judah was coming a Messiah. From the tribe of Judah was going to come one that was going to bring peace, that was genuinely going to satisfy them, that was genuinely going to bring this spiritual nourishment that they needed. And notice that what David does here in verse 4. David was a witness to the people to remind them that God was going to bring this covenant one day. He was a witness and he was a leader. Now was David a perfect leader? Was David a perfect witness? No, he wasn't. He struggled he was a man of blood on his hands, right? He was a warrior. And because of that, he couldn't build a temple, right? But what does this coming one do? He's a perfect witness to the truth. He's a perfect leader. He's the perfect dread of life. He's the perfect living warrior. Do you see how this works? Everywhere in the Scriptures, you have the seed of this coming one. Behold, you call a nation that you do not know, a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has glorified you. Now remember this covenant-keeping God is going to bring this everlasting covenant. Now when this Messiah comes, when this Messiah comes, He's now going to stand and the people, not just one nation, but all peoples are going to be what? drawn unto Him. He's going to call out, come, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what's going to happen? Now the nations are going to come to Him. Listen to what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah 43, verse 6. I'll flip back and read it for you. I shall say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my son from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. That's the Messiah. That's the Savior. When He comes and establishes this everlasting covenant, O oh, Jewish people, when He comes, He's going to draw all the nations. 
And they're here in Jupiter. I saw them with my own eyes the past two days. They're vast, beautiful people. They range in color. They range in race. They range in age. They are God's people that He's calling to Himself. And we don't know who they are. That's why we've got to go to them. We talked with a guy named Sean. He's close to the kingdom of God, but he's wrestling with things. But we were there to be a faithful witness to him, to share with him the truth of God's Word and the love of God. And that's what this apartment complex needs. That's what the people of West Palm Beach need. That's what the people of Jupiter need. Don't miss that verse 5 because that's an evangelistic verse. He's going to call and a nation is going to come. You can insert the word peoples with that word nation. So verse 6 is taking us into our, our last paragraph. Come near to this complex God. Now when you hear the word complex, don't fear. But we'll have to understand some things about this God through these verses. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. Now we were singing a song and it said, His love never runs out. Do you realize that love of God is infinite? It's unending. It is not going to stop. But there is going to come a time when that God's love will be turned into judgment towards some. And because God is love, He judges. Because God is love, He hates sin. Because God is love, He loves His own glory. He loves His own justice. And we don't know when that time is going to end. So that's why we have to be about His business now. That's why we have to seek Him now. I was listening to a gentleman talk with someone about Christ and the guy was trying to, 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 to change the subject and the gentleman said, No, sir, I'm concerned about you today. That's how important the gospel is, that we should be concerned about people today. I am concerned about the people in this room today. I am concerned about your relationship with Christ today. Because he tells us that there's going to come a time that he's going to shut his mercy off from those so they cannot be longer, that they no longer seek him. And that, when, that means when you take your last breath on this earth. So seek him while he may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Now this verse, verse 7, is a beautiful verse of repentance. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So if you're going the wrong way, if you're in sin, if you're unrepentant, if you're walking your own way, if you're running like a wild dog in the yard, doing your own thing, He's saying this. Turn away from it. And he's saying this. Let your unrighteous man turn away from those thoughts, the unrighteous thoughts in your ways. Just repent from them. And look at what God says. In the verse 7, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God. He will abundantly pardon. That is Jesus, the Lamb of God, He's such a merciful Jesus. He's saying, come to Him. And He was compassionate and He will pardon all who come to Him. Do you know that, church? That when you share the Gospel with somebody, that when you're sharing Jesus with somebody, you're sharing the most important thing that you could ever share. We were at the Seafood Festival yesterday and I was sharing the Gospel and preaching and I said, I stood up and I said, I got some really good news for you. Although seafood is very good, I've got better news than that food. You have the best news that you could ever give to anybody if you're a Christian. This great God to have compassion, and He pardons 
the sins. Oh, I forgot you. We're Jewish for the next 30 or 40 minutes. But do you see how when the Jews heard this message, I know for me I would hope my heart would long for this one who is going to come and pardon sin, who is going to come and be merciful, who is going to come and do away with the sacrificial system, who is going to come and give his life. Because what do we have? The neighboring verse chapter was Isaiah 53. This one who was going to bring in this new covenant through his sacrificing of his own life. Now, verses 8 through 13, we turn a corner here. We get a small glimpse into this great working, this great mind, the great ways of the God that we serve. The baby's not bothering me. It, I'm used to it, so please don't, don't leave because of that, okay? We'd love you to stay. He says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. We need to come to terms with that. That the way we think and the way we do things aren't always God's ways and aren't always God's thought. But let's just be honest. We live in a culture. And our culture influence the, it influences the way we think and it influences the way we live at times. Right? It, it does. And so he gives an illustration here in verse 9 now. He's, he's uh, the prophet's word. He's, a, he's like a patient, a patient teacher, Hugo, teaching students. We, we are students. We need things to be broken down on elementary levels so we can understand it. And just like I shared in Sunday school, this is about as elementary as you can get here when you look at verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So if we stood out in the field and we looked up, we would see the clouds are higher than where we're standing right now at this time. God's saying, listen, the way I think, the, my economy, the way I do business is a lot higher than the, your thoughts. Okay? The way I do business is a lot different than your ways. Now we're Jewish, right? This idea of one coming and taking away their sins so they no longer had to work for it, so they no longer had to follow these traditions, is radical to them. It's so radical to you people. I know. That you no longer have to work for it. It's done. At the cross, it's done. So now we have this God saying, I know this is going to be different from you, but listen, I think different than you do. I do things different ways than you do. Just trust me. Trust me. And then he goes on again to unpack another picture of this great God. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word. Now, if you don't have that word, those two words underlined, my word, you need to underline that if you write in your Bible. Be that goes forth from my mouth. So as snow falls in the higher regions of our country, eventually the snow falls, it begins to melt. As it melts, it begins to slowly seep into the ground and nourish the ground. As the rain sometimes pounds the earth, or the rain sometimes gently falls upon the earth, saturating the ground, causing little seeds to begin to sprout and bud and crack the earth and begin to grow into gigantic plants and trees. So God's word is the same. You are sitting here today if you're a Christian. Every time you read the word of God, every time you sit under the preaching of biblical preaching, your soul is being nourished. Your soul is growing. That's why I tell my girls when I disciple them or tell anybody I disciple, read the Word of God. Read a good translation. You don't want to read a heretical translation. You want to read a good translation and just read it. You may think, oh, I'm not getting anything from this. You just keep reading the Word of God. 
you keep flooding through its pages, you let the Word of God keep flooding into you, you are going to get it. If you study anything for two years, you'll become better at it. Better at it. Better understanding. And write down your questions. It's okay to question. You know that? It's okay to ask questions. You got a pastor here. You got leaders here, men. They can help you. They can help you. It's okay to ask. We had a girl ask a question the other night about God's Word. And she said, I was afraid to ask. Why? Don't be afraid. It's okay. God's Word will feed you. It will cause your, you to grow and you will sprout. But see, now we can kind of flip that coin around. The Word of God feeds you. It causes you to grow, mature, and sprout. It causes you to know, Jews, that a Messiah is coming. Now, when that Messiah comes, Jews, I want you to turn around and give it out also. Because what does that do? As you give the word out, it causes other hearts to sprout. Right? Do you understand? You see how God's kingdom works? It's a kingdom of a bunch of messengers. What does Hebrews say? You, if you've read through Hebrews, he says... I implore you. You are ministers of reconciliation. Flee with people to be reconciled unto God. That's what you are. You are ministers of reconciliation if you're a Christian. If you're a born again believer. You're simply taking in the word. Letting it change your life. And you're giving it out. You're like a, a broken refrigerator. You're spoiled. It just, just comes out of you. You're taking in the word and you're giving it out. Now, the only thing that can stop that is you. If you don't give the word out. And you know what stops that most of the time? I'm going to be honest with you, because I see it in my life. Fear of man and the idol of reputation. I'm just going to be honest with myself. Fear of man and the idol of reputation. You have to let the Lord break you of that. And His word is true. You can have confidence in it. It will bear fruit. What does he say here in the Word? He says it very clearly. He says it will bring forth sprout, giving seed to the sower. That's the person who plants and giving bread to the eater. That's the person who puts it in his mouth. So you got one putting it in the ground. You got the ground producing the produce. And you got the person putting it in his mouth. I'm going to read verse 11 again. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, notice my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose. Now do you realize that this word is God's word? Now you say, now wait a minute, Tommy, it was, it was written by men. It was written by men. But they were led by the Holy Spirit and God used their personalities to give us His word. And this is God's word. Let me read to you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I'll get that, don't worry about it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Listen to what the word of the Lord says. All scripture is breathed out by God and proper, profitable for teaching, for a proof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So let's back up and look at those first six words. All scripture is breathed out by God. So do you realize that God gave us this word is going to accomplish its task. It's going to do the desired work that God, want, God wants. What holds us back? What holds us back to realize what we hold in our hand is a fruit-producing machine. 
It produces fruit in your life. It produces fruit in my life. Therefore, it can produce fruit in others' lives. And notice what the Lord says here. So it, not, it will not return to him empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the things which I sent. Now with that said, remember we talked about the judgment of God and the mercy of God. If people don't receive the mercy of God, that they will receive the judgment of God. That's just the reality. See, God's word never, is never going to return void. This is the way I share with people sometimes. Come to God's mercy while there's still time. Because there's still time for you. But if you don't receive God's mercy today, see, God's word is going to not be a, a healing balm for you, but it's going to be a gavel on a judge's table. It's going to slam down... And God's word will become a great judgment to them against all the sins that they've committed against his majesty and his holiness. See, that's God's word's not going to return empty. So when you're sharing it, it's either going to be music to that person's ears and they're going to eventually receive Christ, whether it's that day or whether it's later, or either for the unbeliever, this word is going to be the very thing that condemns them. Either way, God will be glorified. That's a hard truth, but it's the truth nonetheless that God will be glorified because He's creator. He is sustainer and giver of all things. It's a hard truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. That if we hesitate and not receive Christ while there is still time, then this word that gives life to all those who come will be the very word that condemns them because it's true and it's just and it's right. And it's God's word. But look at this, this picture in verse 12 and verse 13. Paul, how long do I have? Uh, another hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stop soon. All right. For you shall... I love it, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That's the picture of salvation. You Jews, the Messiah is coming. He's coming one day. And when He comes, everything will break forth in joyous rejoicing. He's coming. All right, now we're back into reality. He has come. He has come. And every bird chirping in the trees glorifies God. Every blow of the breeze glorifies God. We are the only thing in creation that goes, no, I don't want anything to do with you. Those unbelievers. But for us who believe God, we go, God, we're a humble, broken people, but we love you, Lord. And we rejoice over what you've given us. We rejoice over the gospel. We are a broken people, but we are redeemed. Even creation can worship God. Everything glorifies Him. Look at verse 13. Instead of a thorn shall come up the cypress. So now instead of rotten and filthy things the creation is going to be renewed. Now this is a far-reaching prophecy still, maybe when the earth is totally redeemed. And there's nothing bad. Creation is no longer groaning as Roman talks about. It's no longer groaning. Groaning is renewed. It's made brand new. That there's no more sin left. That the thorns are no longer here, but they're going to bring forth gigantic cedars. Instead of the briars shall come up the myrtle. And I shall make a name for the Lord. An everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. There's His everlasting covenant. Jesus' throne, His kingdom will never end. And the sign is the cross. The sign is the cross of Calvary. It will never be cut off. 
So you want to get in the fruit business, the produce business, and Carl, start sharing God's word. Maybe it won't be tangible fruit you hold in your hand, but you want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. Do you? Maybe you haven't received Christ. Maybe you need to receive Christ. There's still time. You still have breath in your lungs. God's Word is still a, a healing balm to your soul. It can redeem you. It's not yet the gavel that will bring the judgment. Come to Him while there's still time. There is still time. There's hope for you. There's mercy for you found at the cross. So I leave you with the application point. Just one. Are you letting the Word of God into you? And out of you. So are you feeding from the Word of God? Are you letting the Word of God change you? And then are you giving that Word out? You ought to be like a water hose hooked to a faucet. Letting it go through you and right out of you. You don't have to feel. You don't. I know you do at times. You're just like me. You struggle at times. But you don't have to because this God says fear not. Perfect love casts out fear. It casts it completely away. These people that you stand before, you work with, you live beside, they don't know Jesus. They don't know Jesus and they need you to be a witness in their life. Yes, you need to love them and serve them. But just as Paul and I were talking yesterday, in end, whether you build a relationship for two years or two days or two minutes, yes, or a somewhat of a relationship can be built within a matter of seconds. You can introduce yourself, smile at someone, introduce yourself, give them a warm smile, and just watch them light up. People walk around with with a sad look on their face. Our, our society is a society that we individualistic. We're a society of earbuds and focused on the next thing we're going to do. If someone comes up and shakes your hand and smiles at you, what are you going to do? You're going to listen to them. Because we're made for, a, I know I'm kind of going off a little topic, but we're made for relationships. We are relational people. The Trinity is nothing but a big relationship. Father, Son, and Spirit. God was complete within Himself from the beginning of time. He's a relational God. You're a relational creature. So when you relate with somebody else, they're going to listen to you. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be nervous. The Word of God gives us confidence. Get this Word in you. And then let it out of you. John MacArthur, a great pastor I look up to, said the Word of God is like a lion. You let it out of the cage. It'll take care of itself. It's true. It's true. You don't have to take care of a lion. It takes care of itself. So, we'll close now. And I want you just to examine your life. I want you to examine your heart as you sit here. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, that we must examine our life. We must Test our life to make sure we're in the faith. Unless we fail the test. If we fail the test, the Bible calls us to repent. Repent means change your mind. Place your faith in Christ. And then when you repent and place your faith in Christ, you will bear fruit. It's just a natural act, outworking of the Word of God invading your life. If you're not bearing fruit, if you're not repenting, if, you're not, if you don't place your faith in Christ, then you're not born again. I love you enough to tell you that. But <coughs> You're 50, you're 15. That's just the truth, okay? So, if you have not repented, if you have not placed your faith in Christ, if you have not put your faith in this Messiah, I plead with you to do it today because you're not promised tomorrow. Let the power of God invade your life. Let the Word of God invade your life. Okay, so I'm ask everybody to just bow their head. If there's anybody here that, that wants to receive Christ, just... Simply stand up. Stand up. And afterwards, if, if you want to come up and talk with me and Paul, please come up and talk with us. Okay? I want to pray for you. Lord, I, I thank you for this time.
I praise you for your word because your word works on me. It works on Paul. It works on everybody here. Daddy, your word is powerful. Your spirit is in your word. And I thank you for that. I pray that as we, we've listened to your word today, that we have sat under the, the chapter of Isaiah 55, we've learned from it, we've, we've taken the sponge and we've wrung it out and we, we've taken it in. I pray to change us and make us more like you. I pray to give us a greater confidence in you, in what you're doing in our life. I pray that if, if there's someone here who's not genuinely born again, they haven't genuinely repented and placed their faith in Christ, that they would do so. I pray for this community. I pray for this apartment complex, these new buildings going up. I pray that people would be saved. I pray over the community outreach, Lord. I pray over everything that's going to go on this year in this church for the name of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, as far as vacuuming, cleaning bathrooms, cleaning the roof, whatever it may be, let it all be for your glory, Lord. When I come back, maybe at the end of this year, maybe next year, new faces will be here because of the faithfulness of the gospel and the power of your word to be shared. Give your children boldness and knowledge on how to share the gospel, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, indwell us. Give us that knowledge and boldness that we plead for, I ask, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. I thank you for the gift that you give us, Jesus, of yourself. I thank you for coming and dying on that cross, taking the just wrath of God that I deserve, coming up out of the grave on the third day and being resurrected. I thank you that we can have confidence in you. Lord, give us great assurance today. And Father, I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.